Take your Bibles tonight and your outline there in your prayer bulletin, and let's open up, if we could, to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, as you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, the story is told about six men who, uh, they were shipwrecked on a deserted island, and they were pretty certain that uh, there would be no hope of rescue. It's kind of interesting that this group, two of them were Jewish, two of them were Catholic, and two of them were Baptist. And they figured, well, they are stuck on this island, we've got to have a church. And so the two Jews got together and they founded Temple Emmanuel. The two Catholics established the Church of the Holy Name. And the two Baptists established two separate churches and then immediately got into a squabble to figure out who got to call it First Baptist. (laughs) Back on August the 26th, we looked at a message entitled, Living in Unity. The Downward Path to Greatness. Tonight, Living in Harmony, Resolving Conflict. Living in Harmony, Resolving Conflict. Another story is told about a high school orchestra. They were playing a concerto that featured a piano introduction. It was supposed to be just this this grand introduction before the orchestra followed. Well, beforehand, the, the orchestra always tuned up to the oboe. And they would tune up to the oboe playing an A, and the rest of the orchestra tuned up with their appropriate note. The oboe player was a little bit of a practical jokester. And so the oboe player, without anybody knowing, tuned the oboe a half a step higher. And the entire orchestra got tuned to that half step higher. Didn't tell anybody. The concerto starts out with this beautiful piano piece at the beginning, and then the orchestra comes in. And you know what that sounded like. The orchestra sounded great, but not with the piano. And so I don't know if they got a good laugh about that, and I don't know if that oboe player got any kind of discipline out of the deal, but had to stop the concert, get everybody tuned up correctly before they could go on. In Paul's letter, what's the point of these two stories? Well, tonight as we look at Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is going to mention two members in this church whose lives are out of tune with each other. The Bible calls you and I to live in both unity and harmony. And this is a a couple of ladies, they were definitely playing off key. A couple of ladies by the name of Yodius and Santuki. And we read in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodius and I beseech Santuki that they be of the same mind in the Lord. What is the difference between unity and harmony? Unity, uh, or we, in keeping it in musical terminology, we would call that the melody. The melody is the main tune. It's what the song is about. It's the one that you recognize the song by. Uh, you remember many, many years ago that game show called Name That Tune? I don't remember who the host was, but I remember watching it. And, you know, they, they give you a little description of the song. You have these two people squaring off, and I can name that tune in five notes. And they'd go back and forth until somebody was able to name that tune. Well, you named the tune based on the melody. You based the, the, what you knew is what was played in unity. It was the main sound. But harmony is all those extra notes, that, that beautiful... Uh, array of notes that are added in that blend and they form the chords and and just give fullness and give body and all that to to the song as a church we are living both in unity or melody and harmony and both are vitally important so as we look at the outline tonight we're going to start out by looking at roman numeral number one the stand the stand chapter four verse one paul tells them to stand fast in the lord my dearly beloved. But before we look at the stand specifically, letter A is the passion. The passion. As you look at this, two times the Apostle Paul uses the phrase to describe them, his dearly beloved. And then one time each, they are called the longed for, my joy, my crown. Keep a marker here, if you would, and go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look at verses 9 and 10 or excuse me, 19 and 20. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible asks the question, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. 
Paul was able to look at those people in Thessalonica just like he looked at the people here at Philippi, and he says, you are our joy and our crown of rejoicing. These are individuals that the Apostle Paul had had the privilege of either personally leading to the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation, or he had a part in their salvation. And that, for a child of God, is one of the greatest joys when you can look out amongst a crowd and say, oh, I remember sitting down with this individual. I remember opening up the scriptures. I remember hearing that individual pray as they called on the name of the Lord. I remember having a part in leading them to Christ, maybe spending weeks, months, maybe even years just faithfully being a witness to that individual. And they finally trusted the Lord as Savior. Do you have people in your life that are like that. Can you imagine what that scene is going to be like in heaven someday as you look around and you see the individuals that you either had a part in bringing to know, to know Jesus Christ as Savior, or maybe you were, had the privilege of being there at the harvest. You got to be the one that was right there when they trusted Christ as Savior. And imagine the joy as you look around in glory and you see those individuals. Paul says, I'm getting a jump on the joy. I'm seeing you now. And he says, even though in his mind's eye, he wasn't physically there, but in his mind's eye, he could see these people. And he says, you are my joy. Oh, I rejoice every day over you. And, and I know in heaven, you know, the rejoicing now and the future joy in heaven, you are the crown. You are going to be that in heaven for me. Uh, you know, Christians, let's think about that and let's apply that to our life because that's something that every one of us ought to be able to say. We ought to be able to look around us and see those that we have at least had a hand in bringing to Christ. But letter B is the position. The position, stand fast. The Apostle Paul did not say, stand fast in your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas, your feelings. He said, stand fast in the Lord. You see, that's where churches and people and relationships, that's where we get into trouble. Because we stand fast in our opinion. We stand fast and this is the way to think because it's my way to think and I want everybody to think like I think. And if everybody just think the way that I would think, we wouldn't get along with each other, would we? Because we don't get along with ourselves sometimes and we have all sorts of internal conflict. God never told the church to think like anybody in the church. Isn't that something? God didn't tell us to think like the greatest preacher, the greatest leader, the greatest missionary that's out there. He didn't tell us to think like them. He said that we are supposed to stand fast in the Lord. That's where our feet are supposed to be firmly planted, in the Lord. You see, if, if we, when we talk about having the same mind that Christ has, to be like-minded, there is absolutely no way. If we're trying to line up with somebody else's mind here, we're going to drive ourselves crazy. It'll never work. But if we all line up with the mind of Christ, now that'll work. And wow, what a, what a family that's going to be that is aligned with the mind of Christ. He says, stand fast in that position. You know, there is such a thing as, as good stubbornness and bad stubbornness. The problem is the average individual monopolizes on all the bad stubbornness. In your marriage, you got a stubborn spouse that just, you know, it's their way or the highway. Don't you dare admit it. But you know what kind of a conflict that is. Do you work with somebody that's bullheaded? That it's their way or the highway, and it's going to be this, and this is how it's going to be. And nobody else, unless you cave into their way, there's not going to be any harmony or peace. Imagine how devastating that would be in a church. The Bible says, have the mind of Christ. And when we have the mind of Christ, we can stand stubbornly, and it's a good stubbornness, when we are standing upon the promises and the Word of God. That is a good stubbornness to have, where we don't back down from God's Word. So Roman number number two brings us to the situation. The situation in Philippians 4, verse 2, we already read it. The Bible says that Yodius and Sintuki, I beseech you that you be of the same mind in the Lord. The situation. Two women, Yodius, her name means sweet fragrance. Sintuki means pleasant acquaintance. These two women are not getting along. Does the Bible tell us what their issue is? Does it matter? I'd like to know. I mean, you know, I'm curious. No, we don't need to know why they're not getting along. We just know that something's going on, they're not getting along. Here's something that you've got to get out of this. These two women are not spiritually immature busybodies. They are not that. These two women, the Bible says, are Christian workers with and for 
Paul. I believe these are two strong, spiritually mature women. Do strong, spiritually mature Christians ever disagree? Sure they do. You know, we, we want to always relegate that to, well, that's just being babies. That's just spiritual immaturity. Oh, no, it's not. We looked at this a few weeks ago. Remember the Apostle Paul? And him and Barnabas went head to head, and the contention was so sharp between them. Why? Because of a guy by the name of John Mark. Barnabas says, we need to take him, because Barnabas, remember, his name means encouragement. We need to take him along with us. And Paul says, I don't think so. He did something back in such and such a place. I don't want him along on the journey. Oh, yeah, but this would be so encouraging. This would be such a help to him. No. And I just, I would love to have been privy to that discussion back and forth as they argued. It was an argument. It wasn't a calm little, passive little debate. Let's chat about it. They argued. These are two strong, spiritually mature individuals. And they parted ways. And you know what? God blessed all their ministries. You know what else you don't see in the Scripture? You don't, see the, you don't see God chiding Paul. You don't see God chiding Barnabas. And you don't see the Lord chiding Yodius and Sentuki specifically. That's really not a chiding. He's just saying, be of the same mind in the Lord. That's the nicest chiding you're ever going to get, isn't it? I mean, it's just the calmest, most rational thing to say. Just be of the same mind, ladies. John Wesley and George Whitefield, both powerful preachers of the past, preached with each other, preached for each other, got along great until something happened. And the two parted ways and never met together again this side of eternity. Did God still bless their ministries? Yeah, in a tremendous way. It's not a good thing when brothers and sisters squawk at each other, but it happens. My guess is that Yodius and Sentuki, whatever the issue was, it was not doctrinal. Because if it had been doctrinal, we know Paul. He would have addressed that. He would have just let that thing ride. So what this had to have been is something that was procedural or something that was personality related. And so that's why we don't know anything about it. If it was doctrinal like Corinth, we know about it. But not this. A fellow by the name of Rob Parsons, I don't know who he is, but the author of Bringing Home the Prodigals, says that more people leave churches because of small issues than important ones. It is not big doctrinal issues. Typical arguments take place over types of buildings, styles of worship, youth work, and if not that, they argue over the flower rotation. A survey of 500 people conducted by Spring Harvest and Care for the Family shows that 74% of respondents thought that people had left the church because of disagreements with other church members. Folks, that's unacceptable, but it does happen. I've got that little quote, I think, in your outline tonight, to dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory, but to dwell below with the saints we know, that's a different story. And boy, if that's not true in the churches today, which is why the third point is the most important point of the message. Roman number number three is the solution. The solution. When there is squawking and squabbling in the house of the Lord, there are some important things that we have to consider when solving problems in the family of God. And in many ways, these things that we are going to look at, these are true wherever you have squabbles at. They are true at your workplace. They're true. You can put the principles into place at home. They are true for, for kids. They could use these things at school. So this is something that you can take home and pass on to your kids. Here's some things that we got to get. Letter A tonight, resolving conflict is work. Resolving conflict is work. I don't have a scripture to go with this. It's just a, one of those obvious points. The easy way out of a conflict is to just walk away, to leave. I don't, me and Yodius and Sintuki, we're having a fight. I'm just going to leave. I'm going to find another church somewhere. I'm taking my toys and going home. That's the way a lot of people today solve their problems in church. That's the way a lot of marriages solve their problems. Conflicts happen in homes all the time. Anybody can walk out of a marriage. That's easy. Staying and working it out is hard work. It takes time. It's work. 
Maybe that's why so many people just leave. They say, ah, the work's not worth the bother. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. To keep family together? Yes, it is. To keep church family together? Yes, it is. It's worth the work. Nothing is ever solved, nothing is ever resolved when people just walk away. You know, you think, well, that's just the easiest thing to do. Just walk away. But nothing's resolved. It is still a cancer in a soul that's never been healed And even though you put layers of calluses over it, it's still there. And you know what happens? People will, they rot, flesh will rot from the inside out. Souls rot from the inside out. That's why we got to deal with things. So resolving conflict is work. Letter B, resolving conflict is the job of those involved. Yodius and Santuki are addressed first. Ladies, get it settled. Get it settled. That's simple. Take a look with me. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Resolving conflict is the job of those involved. In Matthew 5, verse 23. Matthew 5, 23 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, and tell your friends right? No. (laughs) Some of you are like, where's he at? I am not seeing that. (laughs) Go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. All right, let's go to Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse 15. Matthew 18 verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him. What's your next word? Alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. The offended parties are obligated to go to each other and to nobody else. The problem is that typically this is reversed and everybody else knows there's an issue except for the other party that the issue is with. And they hear about it second and third and fourth hand. It comes in the wind and they... Did you know so-and-so's got a problem with you? Well, no. How long has that been going on? Oh, I think several weeks now. Over what? Oh, I don't know. I just heard. You know, that's how it it works. That is unbiblical, folks. That is 100% unscriptural. When there is a conflict between the family of God, resolving the conflict is the job. It is job one of those involved. You don't go to anybody else. You just go to each other privately, and and other things will come with this in just a moment. Now, there's some important things to remember. We can all get our feathers fluffed about stuff, right? And sometimes, it just depends on the day you're having. It doesn't take much to get a burr under the saddle. Some days, it's just like the saddle was lifted the moment you woke up and said, put burr here. You know, it's just one of them days. And so you are easily, instantly upset about something. It just doesn't take much. So here's some rules we got to consider. Number one, was it really an offense or did I just take offense? Was it really an offense or did I just take offense? Go to Psalm 119. Can we admit it that sometimes we are just overly sensitive I mean, that's hard because that puts a lot of responsibility back on our shoulders, but sometimes we are just very, very sensitive. And sometimes on the other side of it, we can say things or we can do things without thinking, without meaning anything that really came off bad. I mean, really bad. But we didn't mean it that way. We weren't trying to be offensive, but it just was really bad. And it's one of those things that you walk away from it and you go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. That didn't come out right. Or, you know, those kinds of things. Look in Psalm 119, 165. The Bible says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. See the the correlation between not being quick to take offense and walking close in the Word of God? It seems like the closer that we are walking with the Lord and loving His Word the less likely we are to be so ultra-sensitive and get our feelings hurt quickly. 
The story is told about a man, he was supposed to stop and pick up some chairs to bring to a Bible study. And the poor guy, he'd had one of those days, and he just flat out forgot the chairs. And so he shows up at the Bible study, and, and the guy says, hey, you got the chairs? And the guy says, oh, forgot it, I am so sorry. And the guy says, that figures, and walks away. Now, what do you suppose the guy that forgot the chairs is thinking when he says that figures? What do you think? How's he taking that? How would you interpret it? Do I? Sarcastic? What else? An insult. What else? Okay. So you would feel a lot of blame, <laughs> blame and shame, right? All right. So it would be really, really easy, would you agree, to take quick offense to that reaction that that guy had, figures, and to be very offended. So you're going to get a lot out of the Bible study that night, right? No. And so this guy with some wisdom, he went to that friend, biblically like he was supposed to, and he says, a little bit ago, I said that I'd forgot the chairs, and this is what you said. Could you please tell me, what did you mean by that? And the guy says, because it's been one of those days. He says, everything since I woke up this morning has gone wrong. He says, if I've touched it, it's broke. If I tried to do it, it didn't happen. Nothing's gone right today. And that was just the last thing that did not go right. He wasn't blaming the guy. It was just a part. He was kind of blaming his day. This is the way the whole day's gone. Nothing's been right. And because that simple little explanation was there, and because the one guy was not quick to take offense, but just kind of wanted to nail down, what are we exactly talking about here? Everything was able to be taken care of. So he resolved the conflict. He went to the individual that was directly involved and took care of it and dealt with it. Christians, that is one of the easiest things. If we just jump to an assumption that, all right, they meant that evil against me. I know they meant that nasty and everything else. What we have done, we have accused the other person. They must have a vendetta against me. They're, they're just, we have judged their attitude, their spirit, that they're just a hateful, mean, cranky kind of an individual. I just happen to be the one today that got it. That's not right. We have accused another brother or sister in Christ of having that kind of an attitude. And we have taken a personal offense and assumed it was personally directed at us. And we don't even know because we didn't go to them. So, you know, we can't just assume somebody was out to get us. That's, that's paranoia. That's a whole level of mental illness. You know, a person that's got paranoia, that's not right. Let's not be a bunch of Christian paranoid people. Here's the second thing. If an issue genuinely needs addressed, and some things do need addressed, have I done it biblically? There are times where things have to be dealt with. Did I do it biblically? What do we mean by that? Well, it goes right back to those verses we looked at in Matthew, but we also have to consider letter A, we have to maintain an attitude of joy. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? Go back to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. One of the shortest verses in Scripture and easiest ones to memorize. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, okay? And the context of that verse is right after we have talked to two ladies that aren't getting along. And we have said, have the same mind that you have in the Lord. Have the Lord's mind. Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. Huh. Do you, I, do you feel like rejoicing when you're button heads with somebody? No. Do you realize that joy, and, and, it's, and now I know it's cliche, but joy is a choice. It's a decision we make. It isn't about a feeling. It's not saying, oh, yes, I feel joyful, so now I can show joy. It's not what the Bible says. Rejoice in the Lord how often? Always. So rejoice in the Lord even when you're kind of sparking with a friend and things aren't going quite as smoothly as possible? Yes. Why is that so important? Have you ever had anybody, and remember biblically, if you have an issue with a brother or sister in Christ, you're supposed to go to them alone. So you're minding your own business at church, and across the auditorium, across the hallway out front, 
Here comes somebody, and they've got a full head of steam. You see them coming. It's kind of like you hear a train off in the distance. And you look, and their eyes are bloodshot red. There's smoke rolling out their ears. And their attitude is already wagging a finger at you. I need to talk to you. They pull you off the side and say, I want to tell you what you did to me. Is that going to solve anything? Or is that going to create a mess? But if you come up to that individual with a joyful spirit, a godly, biblical, joyful spirit, like the Apostle Paul as he addressed Corinth, he loved those people. Even though he wasn't physically there, it's like, okay, we got to deal with this. I've got my arms wrapped around you. I am going to pull you in. I am going to hold you tight. I am going to let you know I love you the whole time. I'm telling you what's going wrong here. And he was dealing with doctrinal things. I'm not even talking about doctrinal stuff here. I'm just talking about those personality clashes, those times where somebody maybe said something that rubbed us the wrong way, or we took offense, we shouldn't have taken offense, but we did, we got our feelings hurt, or whatever. We deal with it the right way. We deal with it biblically. We deal with it with an attitude of joy. Proverbs 27, 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Let her be. Not only do we have to maintain an attitude of joy, we must be gentle. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, the Bible says, Let your moderation be known to all men. The word moderation simply means fair, mild, gentle. You say, I'm too angry, I'm too upset to be gentle. Then you need to go off and cool down somewhere. You need to get gentle. You need to get meek and mild before you go approaching somebody else. Yeah, but then I won't say everything I want to say. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You'll talk more rationally. You'll talk more godly. You'll talk more lovingly to the individual if you cool down. I know we think, i got to handle this now. There are so many things that do not have to be handled this second. And we make everything such a gigantic issue that we just need to learn to chill out pray, seek God, find biblical answers, check our attitudes, all those kinds of things, wait on the Lord's direction. All that has to be done, but we've got to be gentle. Letter C, capital C there. Resolving conflict sometimes requires help. Going back to Philippians 4, 3, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. You go back to Matthew chapter 18, where we were at a minute ago. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 15 says, if your brother has offended you, you go to him alone, you get things resolved. But if that individual will not hear you, verse 16, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear thee, then tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a publican. As Paul encouraged this church family to help these two women who had been faithful co-laborers, there is something that has to be noted here. Paul did not tell those people in Philippi to take sides. He says, help them. Help them he didn't say help Yodius and Sintuki. That's picking sides. Well, fine, I like Yodius. I'll help her. Oh, but I like Sintuki. She's more this. She's a, I'll help her. And all of a sudden, it's still polarized. You still got, you know, it's kind of like left side and right side Twix. A lot of churches are like that, left side, right side Twix. He says, help them. Why? Because they were supposed to be like-minded, working together. So they are one. The two are one. Help them, church. And that's exactly what we're called to do. So sometimes when there is conflict needing to be resolved, if it cannot be resolved between the two, then it has to be resolved with some help. Go to Galatians chapter 6 and say, well, where are we going to get that help? Galatians is going to tell us. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Is it just anybody that can help out to resolve conflict? No. Nope. There's a lot of people that say, well, yeah, I'd be glad to help out. They would be the wrong person. They would not be a help. They would be more of a problem. 
Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, ye which are spiritual, those who are first of all saved, obviously, but those who are walking with the Lord, those who have got a Christian maturity about them, those are the people that can help other people. So ye which are spiritual, hold this spot and back into your outline and back to Philippians chapter 4, letter D, resolving conflict is focused on the goal. What is the goal of resolving conflict? Okay, harmony. What else is the goal? I'm going to give you two goals, so there has to be more than one. What's the goal? Okay, understanding, good. Forgiveness, restoration. What else? Fellowship. What else? All these are good. They're not in the notes. These are good. Write them down. <laughs> Frank. Okay. All right. Anything else tonight? Okay. Okay. Anything else? Ooh, good one there. Testimony. Good. Okay, and those two kind of go together because if there is a conflict in a church, does the world know it? Yeah. You know why the world knows it? Because people talk. Shouldn't. Okay, we can all say, but they shouldn't. Well, you're right. Pat yourself on the back because you got the right answer. Now, you tell me, how do you button our lips when we're sitting together and did you hear about? Oh, boy, things are really tough at church, aren't they? So-and-so still isn't getting along, are they? Boy, you can just, can't you just feel the tension? We need to pray for them. <laughs> All of a sudden, it becomes a prayer meeting after we have essentially gossiped, right? So all these things are a part of it. So the goal, you mean to tell, nobody said that the goal was that somebody's proven right. Huh. I mean, one person's got to be right. Right? You know, I've said before, there's always three sides to every story. When there is conflict, you are typically going to hear one side of the conflict very loudly, very frequently. And you won't hear the other side. Well, then that side's got to be right, because that's what I'm hearing about. Oh, hmm. you haven't heard all sides. And there's always three sides to the issue. There's a Yodia side, there's a Santuki side, there's God's side. And you know whose side's always right? God's side. You know whose side's always wrong? Yodias and Santuki. Because it's true in our homes, it's true at our work, it's true in our church, it's true everywhere. It is incredibly rare that both sides aren't somehow culpable in some guilt is very very rare typically there's guilt on both sides enough to be shared but you're not going to hear well i did no you're going to hear but they did oh, what that's terrible yeah what did you do i didn't do anything i'm a saint <laughs> no <laughs> no there's just something you're not wanting to share god knows the truth so there's never a winner. There's never a winner when there's conflict if things aren't handled biblically. But if things are handled biblically, you know how many winners there are? Both sides get to be a winner. Now, do we want to win or do we want to be a loser? I mean, that seems simple, right? No participation ribbons here. We don't want to be participation ribbon people. We want winners and losers. Do you want to be a winner or you want to be a loser? If you want to be a winner... You got to do it God's way. Here's the two goals that I, that I want to share with you, plus all the other ones you mentioned tonight. Excellent. Chapter 4, verse 2 of Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 2 of Philippians. I beseech Yodius and Santuki that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So, goal number one, that they be like minded. That they be like minded. Not Yodius having Santuki's mind, not Santuki having Yodius's mind, like minded. That the mind of Christ. 
And we go back to what we started with tonight. Being one-minded is what the church is supposed to be. We have got to get on board with God's mind, God's direction. It is His church. He is the head of the church. And every single one of us, myself included, are under Him. It is up to His mind. Be like-minded. Number two, this was mentioned as well. Go back to that passage in Galatians. Back to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. The Bible says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So number two, restoration. Restoration of friendship. Restoration of a lot of things. That's got to be our desire. We have got to look at our church family, and if there is a passionate love for each other like there ought to be, even though conflicts will happen, even though people will butt heads from time to time because we do have different personalities, there's got to be a desire to restore, to put it back together. We cannot be content by saying, well, it's better than it was, but it'll never be the same. We can't settle for that. We just can't settle for that. That is settling. Do you think there's anything in Scripture where God wants us to look at one another and say, it'll never be the same? The Lord will fix your wagon. He'll put their mansion right next to yours. You can enjoy them for all eternity. I don't know that that's true. <laughs> but wouldn't that be funny? You know, Christians, restoration, it is so important that we work together harmoniously and in unity. I hope tonight that there are no conflicts among us here. But if there are, they need to get resolved. We don't have time to get off into this tonight, but maybe you're saying, okay, I've tried to resolve conflicts with people, but they won't have anything to do with it. I've done all the right things. They don't want anything to do with it. You cannot force somebody else to respond correctly. That's not your problem. You do what God's told you to do, and you leave it there. You still love the person. You don't hold bitterness and unforgiveness against them. You don't you know, snub them or anything. You say, but I say hi to them. They won't even talk to me. I keep saying hi to them. I mean, you do what's right. That's what the Lord's told us to do. You show them God's love, and you leave the results to the Lord. Hopefully tonight we can all say that if there should be conflict, that we want to handle it God's way because we don't want there to be any fraction in the family of God here. And hopefully that is our heart's desire as we look around tonight and say, I don't want anything to ruin what we've got here. And I am willing to, you know, if I have offended somebody, I am so willing. I want to go to them, and I would just want to ask their forgiveness. I want to apologize. I want to be quick about it. I didn't mean to offend them. And, and maybe you say, well, yes, I did. I had a bad day. <laughs> and I took it out on them. You still, you humble yourself, and you get to them. You say, this is exactly what I did. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And then we need to be willing to give that forgiveness. Harmony and unity in the family of God. That's really, really what it's all about. So Christians, will we commit ourselves to that tonight? Maybe you're here this evening and you don't know Christ as Savior. There is a conflict that you are involved in right now, and it's between you and God. When we are talking about interpersonal conflicts, both sides are always at fault. Somehow, to some degree, both sides have always got some fault in there. But lost soul, the conflict that you are involved in tonight, God is 100% right. You're 100% wrong totally wrong. You're a sinner. Jesus died for you. He has made it possible to have a relationship with you, to offer you forgiveness, to offer you a spiritual friendship like nothing you've ever known, to show you a love that you have never experienced, to give you a brand new life, to change you completely from the inside out, that's what Jesus Christ has done for you on Calvary's cross and at the empty tomb. And tonight, Jesus wants to save your soul. But you have to get to that point where you say, God, I've been 100% wrong. 
I've been wrong in how I've tried to be right with God through works and religion and whatever. I have been wrong in, in being a God myself, trying to fix myself. I repent and I believe the gospel. That is doing a 180. That is saying, God, you were 100% right. I'm 100% wrong. Tonight, I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. Lost soul, would you do that tonight? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Now, I don't know if, if I'm talking to anybody here tonight, who I'm talking to, but if you don't know Jesus as Savior right now, would you be willing to pray something like this? Lord, I am a sinner. And I have been so wrong. I was conceived in sin. I was born in sin. I am a sinner. And I'm on my way to an eternity in hell. And Lord, everything that I've tried to get right with you, I've been wrong. But Jesus, you did everything for me. You died. You were buried. You rose from the grave. And Lord, I believe that with all of my heart tonight. Lord, I believe that. And there is no other way to be saved but through Jesus. And tonight, Lord Jesus, I ask you to save my soul. Come into my heart, Lord, forgive me. I want to be a child of God. Tonight I repent and I believe the gospel. Have you prayed something like that tonight? You say, I've never prayed that before. But you meant it. If so, would you just slip your hand up tonight? Nobody looking around tonight, but you prayed it and meant it tonight. Then our Heavenly Father, this evening we thank you, Lord, for this family, brothers and sisters in Christ that we love so much and we know, Lord, that you have put us together in this place for this time for a reason. And Lord, we, to remain in unity, to remain in harmony with one another as we should, it's going to take work. It's going to take us dying daily to ourself and desiring the mind of Christ above all else. So Lord, may that be our goal, that we would be more and more like-minded with you on a daily basis, and that we might see that transform our relationships with one another. To that end, we pray tonight, Lord, and thanking you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.